The war in Ukraine is a war of attrition and therefore it's also a war of production. So in this video, I want to look at the production capacity on the two sides and make a few remarks about how we can use the GDP numbers to get sort of a rough idea about the production potential. And of course, the uh, combined production capacity is much bigger on the Western side than it is in Russia, but there are different ways that this can be measured and I think it's useful to get some numbers on it. So let's talk about it. The war in Ukraine has turned into a war of attrition and wars of attrition are generally decided by two things. On the one hand, there is of course how big losses you're taking, how many soldiers are you losing, how much equipment are you losing. And then on the other hand, there is the question of production capacity. How much new equipment can you build to replace those losses? So the question of production capacity is absolutely vital to understanding the military potential of a country that is fighting a war. And if you want to know how productive a country is, then you typically look at the GDP. Uh, because the GDP, or the, the, the gross domestic product, is a number for how much that country has produced in a year. And a while back, I saw one of Jake Bro's videos where he was talking about how the combined GDP of NATO is 21 times bigger than Russia's. And the point was that, of course, uh, if NATO decide to outperform Russia in the production of military equipment, then they can absolutely do that. So uh, I thought it would be interesting to dive a little bit into these numbers and to just explain how military analysts typically talk about GDP in terms of defense budgets and military production capacity. And uh, just for simplicity, uh, what I've done is that I've taken the GDP of all the NATO countries and combined that with the GDP of Ukraine and said that, well, that's one block. And then we have the GDP of Russia and uh, their partners on the other side. And their partners in this calculation are Belarus, Iran, and North Korea. And uh, these numbers are the IMF forecast for 2023, and I took them from Wikipedia. Uh, and if we take those two blocks and we put them side by side, then uh, this is the picture we get. The combined production capacity of the West is many times bigger than the production capacity of Russia and their supporters in the war. It's pretty close to the numbers that Jake Bro mentioned in his video. He, uh, his uh, numbers was that the, the Western GDP was 21 times bigger. In my calculation, it's actually 22 times bigger. So NATO plus Ukraine have 22 times more production capacity than Russia, Iran, North Korea, and Belarus. So this is just to give a broad idea about the relative production capacity on the two sides. The goal is not to be super exact about it. One question that I think could be asked about this is where does China fit in? And what if we count China on the Russian side? And obviously that would increase uh, the Russian production capacity dramatically if we also included all of China's production. But I think it would be misleading because China does not actually provide direct military assistance to Russia. Uh, they do all kinds of other things where they help Russia circumvent the sanctions, but they don't, they don't provide weapons for the war. And overall, I think it would be wrong to count all of China's production as being on the Russian side, because if we look at China's trade relations, then many more of their products are going to the Western markets than are going to Russia. Um, and also another thing I would say is that if we count China uh, on uh, the Russian side, then I think we should also count more than just NATO on the Ukrainian side, because Ukraine is obviously also supported by countries like Australia or Japan, or we can count in South Korea and others. So just to keep things simple, I've only included NATO countries, and then I think it's also most correct not to count China on the Russian side. But there are there is more than one way to measure a GDP, and in this calculation so far, I've only used what's called the nominal GDP. Uh, so that is the total GDP when counted in US dollars. And that actually introduces some significant problems with the calculation because most countries uh, obviously don't use US dollars and they, they have their own currency. And that means that the figures for the GDP to a large extent actually depends on the currency exchange rate. So if the currency exchange rate goes up or it goes down, then it will look as if the GDP has changed, even if the production is exactly the same. Uh, so what you can do instead is that you can use a figure for the GDP where it's corrected for what's called purchasing power parity. So this is abbreviated as PPP. And uh, this is 
essentially the same observation that we all make when we travel abroad, that sometimes things are cheaper or it's more expensive than, than what we used to. And it's the same thing when states go out and they buy things. So if you're Russia, for example, and you're the Russian government, then you would typically be able to buy more with your money because the, the prices are cheaper than if, if you're the American government. So um, when we're trying to compare defense budgets and military production capacity, we will very often use GDP corrected for PPP. And if we use those numbers in this calculation, then it's more equal because the countries in Russia's group in this calculation are generally places where the prices of products tend to be cheaper than in the West. So the Western GDP corrected for purchasing power parity is still bigger than on the Russian side, but it's not so much bigger. Instead of 22 times bigger, it's closer to about eight and a half to nine times bigger. So which of these numbers is the right one? Is it one to 22 or is it one to nine? And I think the right answer is that it's somewhere in between because there are some areas where it's better to use PPP and others where it makes more sense to use the nominal dollar value. Uh, for example, if, if, if we take something simple like infantry soldiers, they need a rifle, they need a helmet, they need some food, but they don't need a lot of sophisticated equipment. And, these are products that you can typically get from your own domestic production, so you would buy it on the home market. And that's why a Russian infantryman is, of course, much cheaper than, say, a German or a British or an American infantryman, because their equipment is cheaper and also the salaries are lower. So if you're trying to figure out how big an army of infantrymen a country can raise, then it makes sense to use a calculation where you count in the value of the purchasing power in that country. But there are also things that Russia has to buy on the international markets. So uh, these are typically Western components for, for example, um, their most sophisticated equipment like precision missiles or radar systems or communications equipment, the, these things. And they will need to buy those products on the international market. Right now, there are sanctions against Russia, so they can't buy them directly from the Western companies. They can evade those sanctions by buying them from middlemen and those sorts of things, but they still have to do it in dollars. So they have to convert their rubles to dollars to pay for those things on the international market. And when we look at more sophisticated equipment, it's, it, it just makes more sense to compare the numbers in the nominal value in dollars and not correct it for PPP because it has to be bought on the international market. So uh, that's why I say that the real number is somewhere in between. The, the Western production capacity is somewhere between nine and 22 times bigger than on the Russian side. And I'm, I'm not an economist, uh, so take this with a grain of salt, but let's say just for the sake of argument that the Western production capacity is 15 times bigger than Russia's in this war. Uh, that says something about how big a challenge it will be for Russia to keep up in the long run if the Western countries have the political will to keep supporting Ukraine. Because relatively speaking, however much the West decides to invest in this, Russia will have to invest 15 times more just to keep up. And if they want to get the upper hand, they will have to invest even more than that. So I don't want to turn this into a whole video about Russia's economy, but they have some serious problems. They are spending so much money on the war right now that it is unsustainable in the long run. They're basically financing the war by using their savings and they're pumping money into society. And there is a significant danger that the Russian economy will be overheating. Um, so uh, if they have to keep investing 15 times more than whatever the Western countries are investing, then it will be very difficult for them to keep up. Um, but of course, it, it all depends on the political will in the West to actually do that and to make those investments. Okay, I will end it here. If you found the video helpful or informative, then give it a like and also subscribe to the channel and click the bell icon to get notifications when I upload new videos. Thank you very much for watching and I will see you again next time.